made project dispatch possible. And uh, of course, today's webcast is part of that uh, work that we're doing in Project Dispatch. Next slide, please. And before I introduce our speakers, I just want to make a quick note that our next webcast uh, for Project Dispatch will be on December 11th. And it'll be at 1 PM Eastern, 12 noon Central Time. And it'll be comprehensive patient-centered care in the ICU. And our faculty for that will be Neil Halpern, who is the chief for the Critical Care Medicine Service at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. And now I'll quickly uh, introduce our faculty and turn things over to them. Thank you. Um, our first speaker today is uh, Jason Adler. He's the medical director for the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit at Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital in Hollywood, Florida. And our other speaker is Eileen Watkins. She's the clinical manager in the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit, also at Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital in Hollywood, Florida. I should note that our speakers uh, today were actually um, applicants for Society's Innovation Award. And so uh, we're very pleased that uh, they're able to uh, present today um, uh, to all of you. Um, I should, uh, right before I um, uh, turn things over to our speakers, remind our attendees that we will have a Q&A at the end of the presentation. And I'll be moderating that. And we'll be taking questions off of the uh, questions or the paint, the chat feature that you see as attendees, and also the raise your hand feature. And so I'll be calling uh, people by name uh, from the raise your hand feature. And then I'll just read your uh, typed in uh, questions uh, to our presenters. And with that, I'll turn things over to uh, Jason and Eileen. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Melissa. Good afternoon, everybody. First, we'd like to thank the Society for Critical Care Medicine Project Dispatch and AHRQ for uh, supporting this series and for uh, inviting us and allowing us to participate and share our story and our experience here at the Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital in Hollywood, Florida with respect to patient and family-centered care and our journey and to share some of our perspectives uh, on this. And I would start by way of saying that uh, it's our belief that there are multiple different ways to do patient and family-centered care. Uh, our way is just one of those ways. and. Um, We've, we've learned a lot of things along the way, and I think the most important take home for us and for me personally has been that this, this has been a, a journey and that it's a, it's a shared experience and that it involves a, a team effort, and that's why I'm pleased to be able to present with my uh, colleagues, my respect very much, Eileen Watkins today, so she can help to share the nursing experience uh, as far as uh, the patient and family-centered care journey. By way of a little bit of background about the Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital, for those who aren't familiar with us, this Children's Hospital was founded in 1992 in Hollywood, Florida, part, as part of a larger um, public health care system of six different hospitals, including our Children's Hospital. In the Children's Hospital itself, we have 224 licensed beds. And our PICU, as it stands today, after some recent expansion projects, uh, projects consists of 22 beds, 12 intermediate care unit beds, and six progressive care unit beds where we care for ventilator-dependent patients who are generally stable. We admit a little over 2,000 patients per year to our combined units. The uh, ICU is staffed by uh, Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital employees we, as the physician and physician extender group here, are a contract group with 24-7 in-house coverage. And while we are not an academic center per se, we are affiliated uh, with some local medical schools here in, in South Florida. And we have medical students and residents who rotate through with us. So moving on a little bit about the evolution of patient and family-centered care here, just to give you a timeline of our experience, we had a director of patient and family center care who started to work with our pediatric ICU and our ICU group back in 2004. So we've been at this for about 
10 years now. Before that, within the healthcare system, patient and family-centered care did not exist either in the pediatric world nor in any of the uh, adult facilities. So we were sort of the beta test, uh, if you will. We started, and I will tell you, we initially did not necessarily all embrace this concept. It took a little bit of uh, assuaging us to get us to embrace this. Uh, the concept of multidisciplinary rounding with families at the bedside began here, and it really was a partnership between ourselves, the patient and family-centered care representatives, our nursing staff, our respiratory care staff, our pharmacy staff, our child life experts, really the, the whole gamut uh, was, in, was involved. And in 2006-2007, our family-centered care rounds became a clinical best practice for our health care system, which was shared at the Leadership Development Institute for Health Care System. We then got involved with Dr. Stephen Beeson, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with, in, in his book, Practicing Excellence. And he was heavily involved with the healthcare system in 2008 and really provided us with some additional education for how to um, really put our money where our mouth was as far as how things that we could do to improve upon our patient and family-centered care experience and our quality as well. In 2009 to 2012, crew resource management was implemented, and we started using rounding checklists and SBAR tools for nursing sign-off. And in 2011, a new freestanding children's hospital was built. And a lot of the focus of the talk that Eileen and I are going to present today really starts in 2012 when we really started to mature a little bit with respect to our patient family-centered care and how we started to look at other air venues for clinical integration with patient and family-centered care. And uh, the, the last note on here is just when our intermediate care opened in 2013. So simultaneously with our patient and family-centered care evolution, there's been a lot of growth in our, in our unit during, during that time. And um, some of this clinical, clinical integration that I'm referring to in this current era of patient and family-centered care here in our pediatric ICU and affiliated units, we have a NICU to PICU transition program. And Eileen's going to be touching on this uh, momentarily. We have a single ventricle program, as I'm sure many of the other pediatric um, congenital heart surgery institutions have around the country. Our heart transplant monitoring program, the evolving role of the nurse in patient and family-centered care. We're going to talk about the intensivist role outside of the PICU and what that means. And we're going to talk about educating and partnering with families at home and give some examples of that. So with this, I'm going to turn this over briefly to my colleague, Eileen Watkins, who is going to speak to you about some of the topics that I've already mentioned. Hello, this is Eileen Watkins, and again, thank you all for allowing us to speak with you about our journey with family-centered care. One of the first topics that I'm going to speak about, it's probably one of the first programs that we really um, have developed and seen a lot of growth with over time, and that's our NICU to PICU transition program. And basically, it started um, due to the need for some of these NICU babies that had prolonged stays in the NICU, that as they developed, they, their needs changed in terms of requiring more developmental um, stimulation and things that the parents may need in terms of parent training. And many of these kids were medically complex patients who were going to have prolonged hospital stays, some of them up to a year, or some of them even a little bit longer. So this was a collaborative program that began between our NICU and our PICU physicians. Um, and they developed a team, which included nurses and respiratory therapists, and came up with a policy of transitioning some of the babies. Now, it doesn't apply to all of the babies that are in NICU that have prolonged stays, but in order to meet the needs of those children. Um, and basically, most of these kids are medically complex babies that are ventilator dependent. And they must be beyond the neonatal period. And many of them are over 40 weeks gestation, some of them older than that, when they get transitioned to the PICU. And they will have extended hospital times. But the, the goal of it is to meet the medical and developmental and the psychological needs of this, these babies who are now becoming older. Um, and work in collaboration with their families to transition them either to the home environment or some of them are not even ready when they're ready to be discharged to go to a home environment, to go to an intermediate um, setting. 
So this has been um, one of the programs that we've actually developed pretty significantly, and we've transitioned quite a few children that have actually been able to go home upon discharge. And we do have some of those children that actually do spend a, quite a long time in our um, pediatric intensive care unit, but we, with the opening of our um, our new smaller unit for the chronic vent patients, they're able to be transitioned out there prior either to going home or to an intermediate care setting. The next um, program that I'd like to talk about is the single ventricle home program. And what we've done when we're looking at the patients that we take care of in the pediatric intensive care unit, many of our children have chronic illnesses and or long term, they're going to be dependent long term on the medical system. So we're looking kind of at the, the children or the, or the families related to their diagnosis and looking of how we can help them because part of our goal is obviously to treat them while they're in the hospital, but also to prevent readmissions. So the single ventricle home program that we have um, refers to our patients who have um, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, hypoplastic right heart syndrome. And it's a follow-up program that is completed by our ARMPs. So in addition to all of the teaching we do while they're in hospital, we also provide them with the tools that they need in order to do very close follow-up. Because this is a known population of infants and children with complex disease. We know that they have a high morbidity and mortality between their interstage repairs. So what this allows is for that constant contact of the family with the ARNPs on a um, two to three times a week basis, or if they have questions or if they have emergencies, that they all can order, get very quickly get access to somebody that can give them some information. So all of our children are discharged with this program, and what we basically provide for them is a scale, so we're monitoring their weight, and a pulse oximeter, so we're monitoring their pulse oximetry. If the parents report this, they can either enter it into a computer program, or they can um, document it on paper in their book. Um, and they're all, um, until they have their second stage repair, they're all followed. So they're followed up during the interstage repair by the ARMPs, but they also have 24-hour phone availability either to the ARMP or to a cardiologist that's on call. <clears throat> the next thing I think that's really important with the advent of patient and family center care is how has that changed the role of the nurse, of the bedside nurse? And basically, I think most ICU nurses are very territorial. And as Dr. Adler alluded to before, it was a transition for a lot of us. And initially, people that have been in the area of critical care for a long time, they're used to having a lot of control of their environment. And basically what, what it's done is break down a lot of the barriers and a lot of the boundaries that we're getting to know our families better and getting to know their family dynamics a little bit better. So in order to integrate all the families into all aspects of the care, we had to do that. And I think it's allowed the nurses to better understand families. We live in a community where there's a lot of um, varying educational and socioeconomic uh, levels of patients and families. And it's allowed our nurses to better understand what their needs are, because they are all different. I think it's also developed that we have very genuine collaboration with all disciplines, not just physicians, but all of our ancillary staff in order to meet the needs of our patients and families. Another thing is the increased advocacy for patients and families. Um, nurses are very much more verbal about what the, pa the patients, but also their families need in terms of moving forward with their care. And it allows our nurses to provide a care during all phases of the um, the child's illness, and they know their patients better. You know, things that we've been able to do in terms of what we've changed is we now have open visitation for all parents 24 hours a day. Um, the parental assistance in care, um, we have parents that are in the room during procedures, during operative procedures, so we're pretty open. They're there at end of life, they're there during codes. So the parents have the ability to be in the room at all times. Um, and then we also, when we're giving handoff, nursing handoff, we do that at the bedside with the family. So the families become an active participant in, in the actual care of their, patient, of their child. We provide tools also for the families. Many things that we've done, some of them have been not, um, maybe not a major thing, but it's been a major thing in terms of the care of their child. One of the things that we've done initially was we did an asthma action plan. And basically what it is is that it's a visual stop sign. So if your child is at this stage green, they're okay. 
They get to the yellow stage. This is what you need to do. They get to the red stage. This is what you need to do. So that they have something that they can look at and they're managing their child's care. And we've had less readmissions for asthma since we've implemented that about three years ago. Um, other things in terms of accommodations, I think that's one of the things that we looked at when we first started doing this, is that we were giving parents things, giving parents things, but not necessarily giving them the tools they needed to manage their own child's illness at home. So things that we've done, um, pharm pharmacy concierge, where the pharmacists will come to the bedside and do medication teaching with the families, in addition to bringing the medication to the bedside so they don't have to leave the unit. Um, we provide parental nutrition for our moms that are breastfeeding. We have a lot of infants in the unit. So we're making sure that their nutritional needs are met, their sleeping needs are met either through bedside sleeping or accommodations at our clubhouse. Um, we also have a program that we just recently started because of the viral season where families who don't have somebody to watch a sibling, we have a sibling companion program where we can arrange an event where there's a volunteer who will stay with the sibling while the mom visits their child if not, they're not able to stay. Another um, thing that we have is a MyChart program where the families can get passwords to get into their child's chart and have access to their medical records from home. So all of these things that we've done are tools that actually allow, rather than just giving the family something, we're giving them the tools they need to help manage their child's illness, whether it be short-term or chronic. When we look at a patient, a specific patient that's been in our unit for a while, <clears throat> we have a nine-month-old child who was diagnosed with cardiomyopathy who had an ischemic stroke um, and is on a left ventricular device awaiting transplant. This mom is very, very involved. The baby's been here since he's about three months old. Mom is from actually out of the area where we live. And she does stay at the bedside throughout the night. And she has the ability to have, and she has the clubhouse room across the street if she needs showers or she needs a break. We always complete nurse handoff in the room with the mom. And she is very verbal in terms of the care of her child. Um, he has a, a, a schedule that he follows that this schedule is actually developed in conjunction with the mom, with nursing, and with his therapy so that we're meeting his developmental needs because that's a big area for these children who have LVADs who are awaiting transplantation because they could be here for many months. Um, the mom also um, participates in interdisciplinary rounds in the morning time and in the afternoon if she's um, available and also is very vocal during that time. The mother does assist with all the dressing changes, any procedures that go on. That includes changing of the LVAD if it needs to be changed, and all of the care of the patient. She completes most of the daily care with the patient and um, remains at the bedside throughout the day with him. There are periodic meetings with the mom to kind of regroup and address concerns that may not be addressed during rounds or psychosocial things that might happen. The mother receives also services through the hospital, such as psychological services, which assist her in coping with the long-term hospitalization, but other things that we can do to help her, such as food discounts, to assist her with coping during the prolonged hospitalization. So there's many things that we've done, and we've come quite a long ways in terms of what we're able to provide. And from a nursing perspective, I think it's allowed the nurses to grow and to become more involved with patients as a whole, rather than just doing the basics of nursing. They're more involved with the psychosocial development and the developmental aspect of the patients. So I think it's been very rewarding for most of the nurses that work here. I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Adler right now, and he's going to talk about the care of the children medically complex. Thank you, Eileen. This, uh, this, again, this talk, I think, really highlights how important it is for us all to collaborate with one another and, and learn from one another. And I, I can't say how many outstanding ideas have come from listening to my colleagues like Eileen in, in nursing and people in our respiratory care department and our uh, family advocates and the families uh, themselves. Uh, and even our patients, when we developed our new children's hospital, sat on the design committee for helping to design what they would want. And I'm always struck now when some of the kids don't want to go home because they enjoy the hospital so much and they enjoy the uh, concierge uh, service. They can order whatever food they want at any time of the day um, uh, and have it delivered to their room. These things are, are really amazing and we've come quite a long way. But in, in honing down on something that I thought 
we are we are struggling with and and that is not unique to us um, but that many of the children's hospitals are struggling with in terms of how to deal with this moving forward I wanted to discuss the topic of care for children with medical complexity in the context of patient and family-centered care because that has been an area of renewed emphasis for us and as we've matured a little bit in our family-centered care journey and not to say that the rounding that we do with the families and how we do that isn't important but I've come to see that all institutions might do that a little bit differently and I think that the important part of that is just that we are engaged with our families and they feel like we're partnering with them the nuts and bolts of how all of us do that might be slightly different but this area of care for children with medical complexity is one where I think we've learned a lot from the hurdles and the stumbling blocks that we've that we've had to climb over to get to where we are today and it's as I mentioned before it is it is a journey and we're still we're still going to be on it for a long time to come I think that this journey is highlighted by some patient experiences, and I'm going to share a couple examples with you. But when I think about the, these children in the context of patient and family-centered care, I think about the changing role of the intensivist and the ICU nursing and, and other staff members, because we, we do a lot of things in the ICU, and I think we don't even realize it. We do acute treatment for patients. We do subacute treatment for patients. Then we get into chronic, complex, recurrent type care for patients. And what about what's our role in anticipating and preventing? I think when we're really providing good critical care, we're preventing things and we're anticipating things. We prevent central line blood catheter associated bloodstream infections. We prevent ventilator associated pneumonias. And those types of things and those quality initiatives really, I think, are at the heart of what is patient and family-centered care. When you merge the quality of care with a, a true patient and family experience, that, I think, is the real essence of family-centered care. And so in talking about this, I, I, I come back to a couple patients that I really learned a lot from. The first patient is just a patient that we've all seen in our pediatric ICU. It's someone with severe chronic lung disease and bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And, and I'm actually thinking of a particular, this is an actual real life you know, patient example that happened to me and what we learned from this. The patient was tracheostomy and ventilator dependent. We inherited this child from a newborn intensive care unit, had severe pulmonary hypertension with a feeding disorder, gastrostomy tube, and fund application. He was developmentally delayed, but at his young age, we weren't sure how developmentally delayed he would ultimately be. He had had intraventricular hemorrhage. He had repeated prolonged hospitalizations, multiple readmissions. The family saw us many, many more times than they ever saw their primary care pediatrician. The patient had multiple near-death uh, events. In fact, we had multiple bedside conversations about whether it was time to withdraw support or provide palliative care. And the mother really didn't want that. And ultimately, this child survived, weaned off the ventilator, got the tracheostomy decannulated over years, and is living now elsewhere in the country and actually got readmitted here last year with an asthma attack and is doing quite well, and, but does have some long-term significant neurodevelopmental issues. So all of us have seen this patient. And one of the questions is, what have we learned from this? Well, we learned that severe chronic lung disease is really a multi-organ system disease and that this particular population of patients has multiple needs and they, it, it, it spans the spectrum of needs from medical to technological to home care, uh, social and family, developmental and educational. The, and I'm going to come back to some of those topics a little bit later. but. The technologically dependent children are often sent home with parents. You know, at least in Florida, we do have some resources, but you know, every state varies with with respect to this. But we send these children home with parents who are overwhelmed, often inadequately skilled, despite our best efforts to make them as skilled as they can be, and with unrealistic expectations, both of their own and those of others, as to what is is going to be, and. Home is not always the optimal environment for these children. Sometimes patients like this are just too critically ill on a chronic basis, and we refer them to skilled nursing facilities. And in some places elsewhere in the country, like Nationwide Children's Hospital, have inpatient BPD, chronic lung disease units. And they're very, 
family-centered and, and do an excellent job with these patients. I, I, I want to move on to another example, and I think it'll, as we progress onward, I think it'll become clear why I'm discussing this, these, these examples. But the second patient was someone who was very near and dear to us who had a rare congenital anomaly, was one of 600 children in the world with the particular condition that um, she had. And um, you can see on the right-hand side that I'm highlighting how many chronic complex conditions that this, this child had. And you can see that um, as we go through this that she had many uh, complex chronic uh, conditions. At, at one point early in her life, she was admitted with airway obstruction failure to thrive. She required a tracheostomy and later became completely ventilator dependent. She developed recurrent chylus effusions requiring multiple interventions and surgeries. She developed chylocytes requiring multiple interventions and procedures. And in fact, subsequently, with the help of reaching out to other institutions around the country, was diagnosed with a central lymphatic conducting disorder, which was her seventh chronic complex condition. And she was then discharged home after a very long hospital stay. We deemed her to be at high risk for readmission. The pediatricians in her community um, said that they would prefer if we continued to follow her as an outpatient, as an outpatient because this was a very complex and daunting uh, task, and they felt that this was beyond their capability in this in the smaller community in which they lived um, in, in Florida. So we did, and we continued to follow them. And the child was only readmitted once in 10 months for a period of five days, but she was living with significant morbidity until she recently passed away. But we learned a tremendous amount from this child and what it means to be family-centered. The patient with this rare disease, and many of us in our pediatric ICUs have children like this who are, are one in literally one in millions. and this child required, I actually counted, 26 different treating disciplines who were involved in her care. When she went home, she had, I think it was 13 different pediatric subspecialty physicians that she had to follow up with. It's an impossible task for these families. So the question is, what did we learn from this? Well, we learned about the need for family-centeredness. Excuse me, we went ahead a couple slides here, so we'll go back. We defined and discussed the goals of care with the family. When, and when we learned when there is no cure, that it's often better to talk to families in terms of goals of care. And I think that we've learned also from this that really there to make recommendations to people about what we think might happen, but we try not to dictate the treatment plan to them. We like to give them options. And we have found that families, when they hear us trying to partner with them, that that engenders trust. And I think that the communication and trust are really at the heart of the patient family-centered care experience for, for, our, for our families. We learned that difficult families, as oftentimes people are labeled when they're in the ICU and they don't agree with what we're proposing, aren't really difficult at all. They just face difficult decisions, and they're doing what we would do, and they're advocating for their child. So I've matured, and I think a lot of us here have matured in how we approach people, and we look at our role as facilitators and not the judge and jury about what people decide, because what's right for one family may not be right for another. And again, with um, children with medical complexity, that's just that the highlights that one size does not uh, fit all. And having some prior knowledge of the child is often beneficial. So we want to know what happened through prior episodes of care. The electronic medical record has made that a lot easier because I don't know if you have difficulty reading your partner's or your colleague's handwriting. I can't read my own handwriting sometimes when I go back to it. So that has really facili that has facilitated knowing what's gone on through prior episodes of care. And we also learned a lot about the importance of care coordination for these children. And we learned that we, as intensive care units, have the capability and resources to make a major difference in the lives of the families and the, and the children. This article was published in 2011 in Pediatrics regarding uh, children with medical complexity and uh, how they were encouraging 
uh, population of patients for clinical and research initiatives. And what's striking about this is just that it highlights the commonalities amongst the children with medical complexity in terms of their intense service needs, whether they're in the hospital or in a community-based setting, their reliance on technology, polypharmacy, home and um, other forms of congregate care, that they are at risk for frequent and protracted hospitalization with intense resource consumption. They consume a significant portion of the Medicaid dollars in this country uh, every year, and that they have an intense need for care coordination. These patients, more so I think even than, than our patients who are here for acute rare um, stay or short, acute short stays who might have a complex paranemonic effusion as an example or a bronchiolytic who gets intubated. Not to say that we should be any less family centered with those patients, just to say that those needs are somewhat different than the needs of the chronic recurring patient in an intensive care unit uh, setting. And that the, these children with medical complexity need a family centered system of care with access to services, information provided to the families, and that also empowers self-management. When, when I think about why we should be family-centered, sometimes it's hard to make the argument that we should be family-centered, although I think all of us have come in critical care to embrace this, and many of you at your institutions have probably had very similar journeys to what we have had here. But there is an economic argument to be made for this. And when we think about what defines value in healthcare, value is quality divided by cost. And when you think about patient and family centered care, I really equate that with value driven healthcare. In that it is high quality when it's done properly and it really doesn't cost a lot. I think a lot of us feared that we had a high personal cost going into the when we first started family-centered care. When we, we thought about starting family-centered rounds, it was going to take a long time. It was Parents were going to ask a lot of questions on rounds. But being transparent, letting them see the dialogue that goes on, the thought process that goes on, addressing them in language that they understand, coming back and just showing that you, you care about their child and you want to help, that goes a long way, but it doesn't cost a lot of, of money. It does cost us a little bit of time. So that is really high value. And the, there, there is data to support how, approaching patients with complex care needs in, in an integrated fashion. And the group, this group out of Canada, um, uh, I believe this was a group out of Toronto Sick Children's uh, that published their data um, of 81 children with medical complexity that were enrolled in one of two primary care clinics in, in Canada. And when, now granted this is on an outpatient basis, but I think what, I'm, what, you're, what you're going to see and what I'm driving at is that I think a lot of this stop, starts in the hospital environment. And when they enrolled these families in these two clinics in Canada, cost of care was decreased significantly pre and post intervention and that was due to fewer inpatient days. The families reported less out of pocket expense for their children. The children had improved quality of life metrics on numerous different scores that was significant. And the parental scores and people judging how the parents were faring showed higher parental scores and that they felt that they were being partnered with, that their children were receiving comprehensive coordinated respectful and supportive care. So with that in mind, we think about where we are now at Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital and in our pediatric ICU and the extensions of the pediatric ICU. We've had a few developments over the last couple of years that um, are having or causing us to branch out a little bit in terms of the care that we, we provide beyond the walls of just the pediatric ICU. We've developed an outpatient clinic and program for transitions of care and for complex chronic care that's staffed by a couple of our pediatric ICU doctors uh, and uh, there is a 24-7 call availability. Now, granted, it's not a five-day-a-week operation yet, 
um, but we're hoping that it will be at some point. But the, the, the genesis of this and the concept is that we are trying to provide continuity of care, transitions of care for some of these fragile children as they transition from the hospital to the home environment and reintegrate back into their community setting so that the parents have a level of comfort, the kids get the care they need, and if we, it's hard to do everything for a child before they go home from a, a complex, long ICU stay. But by having this clinic, we can see them in a little bit more relaxed setting, usually, and then uh, by going through a basic similar algorithm with all of these children, then we can make sure that they have the needs that their, that their needs are being met. Did we get them their home health aid? Did we get them uh, a a uh, did we get them 24-hour home health nursing? I will just tell you a couple weeks ago, I, I saw a patient that we had sent home with some nasal CPAP. The family was completely overwhelmed. The child had uh, congenital heart disease, had apnea. Um, intermittently, but we thought the child was going to grow out of this. We sent them home on nasal CPAP. The family was completely overwhelmed. The child, um, we got them a home health nurse, and life dramatically improved. That's just one example. It's a, you know, it's a simple thing, but in doing that, we feel like we're helping to provide a true family-centered care experience, and we're improving the um, the the value that people get by improving you know the quality uh, and. Um, so we, we hope to continue that, that journey. The other thing is that our intensivists cover a skilled a pediatric skilled nursing facility in the community. And that's a controversial topic about pediatric skilled nursing facilities. Various people have, have various opinions about whether those should or shouldn't exist. Um, not to comment on the politics of that at all, but suffice to say, I think all of us have children that no matter how hard we try, and our goal is always to send a child home first with medical complexity, uh, provided that the family wants the child at home. Not every family wants their child at home, and not every family has the ability to take care of the child at home and may not want them placed in medical foster care or some alternate pathway for care. So this exists as another option for children, and there are some kids who are just so chronic, chronically critically ill that this serves as an important option amongst the many options that we have for children. And one interesting thing, when the state of Florida recently surveyed those families whose children were in the skilled nursing facility, I think it was more than 80% or almost all of them wanted their child to stay there. They didn't want the child at home. So even though these facilities sometimes get a bad name, I think they do serve an important, uh, an important purpose in terms of giving inpatient providers an option that, that other than just the hospital and the acute care environment for the care of some of these children, and many of those children are ultimately transitioned to home when sometimes when they're willing. We've had a number of children with whom we've done that. So Eileen has already highlighted some of the other initiatives we're doing, such as our NICU to PICU transition team. Uh, there's also a pediatric to adult transition team that's been started here and one of our nephrologists is leading the charge with respect to that and we have been working with our adult colleagues and we're fortunate to work in an institution where we have a pediatric hospital and an adult hospital to work together for the care of, of those children and to try and make it so it's not culture shock when they go from pediatric ER to the adult ER. We want to give them an opportunity to understand that there are going to be some changes, they're going to be treated a little bit differently in the adult world than they are in the pediatric world. Um, and so we've tried to formalize that for our chronically ill um, patients. And again, this isn't something that just the ICU is doing, we're participating, but really it's something that evolved out of the nephrology world. The, um, we recently started a home ventilator navigator teacher, uh, one of our respiratory therapists who is working very closely with the families whose children are going to be going home on a ventilator with a tracheostomy. We've created a teaching module and a binder that they take home with them to teach them about the ventilator and troubleshooting and checklists to make sure that they're uh, competent before they go home. And that's so new, and we've just started it that we haven't been able to measure the impact of, of this yet. We've also begun um, uh, participating in the Global Tracheostomy Consortium and working and really focusing on these complex kids with tracheostomies as they go home and trying to um, make the care that they get as optimal as it can be. The 
other thing that I wanted to mention to everybody is how the partnering of using data to help drive our patient and family-centered care experience because uh, I think it's important for us to m try and measure what we're doing and sometimes this isn't this isn't always easy but when we we've we've looked at the mechanism by which we try to improve our quality in the, in the ICU and I'm sure many of you participate in that um, in that uh, data uh, collect with that data collection tool and we look at things like discharge delays and our hours of admission and we have made staffing adjustments based upon the peak hours of admissions in our ICU and we uh, have looked at our discharge delays and trying to keep those low so that families are getting home in, in a timely fashion and those types of things really are family centered but we're using data to help drive the family-centered care experience. Of course, we're all looking at our lengths of stay and our mortality ratios and our readmissions, and many of you are, are doing doing that uh, as well, if not all of you. And um, again, just trying to, to realize that the quality that we provide in our care really equates with a, a family-centered experience, because after all, you none of us wants to say, yes, they were so nice at that children's hospital, but our child didn't survive the hospital, hospital course. And we, we want people to survive, get back to living with a quality of life, and try and use different metrics to, to evaluate how we're doing on that um, trajectory. And lastly, I would just ma mention to you that we use the Prescani scores, as I'm sure many of you do, to help measure how family-centered we are. And uh, that's something our healthcare system takes very seriously, and that information gets back to our physician group, our nursing group, that information is shared openly, and uh, we, we, we try to strive to provide people with, with a good um, experience. Where are we going to be going in the future with this? Um, I think we're going to be using technology for remote monitoring of, of uh, patients and even getting into physician visits for medically complex children uh, remotely. Um, and then when you think about family-centered care for the children, not having to move a child on a ventilator with a feeding conduit and feeding pump and tubing and bags and take the backup battery and travel perhaps from a remote area to get here and to have them worry about whether they're going to be able to plug in their child's ventilator or their backup battery is going to run out if we can do some remote monitoring of these patients, that really truly is family-centered in bringing the care into their home and in, in their community. We're continuing to try and eliminate the silos of care that exist between physician, nurse, other disciplines, and between disciplines of physicians to try and break those things down so that we're all communicating in a, in a common way with the common goal of caring for the, for the patient. And then also trying to improve the communication and the education of families whose children suffer from critical and chronic illness. So, so that we understand where they're coming from, and they also understand where, where, we, where we are coming from. And um, I could, we could talk about that for an entire day, about communication, and just how doing a simple, I'll, I'll leave you with one example about that. We have a number of patients, you know, as I've mentioned before, with. Uh, who get transitioned from a newborn intensive care unit to our unit for um, for their chronic lung disease if they can't be weaned from a mechanical ventilator. And we've had some patients who, and a lot of those families are very savvy and they pick up on, on what we're doing, and, and they can see how one doctor might differ from another, and they become very, very attuned to that. And so one of the things that we learned from some of these families is if Dr. One is on for one week, and he weans the ventilator by two breaths per minute, and Dr. Two comes on the following week, and he weans it by four breaths per minute. Those two things may be equally acceptable and end up with, a, with the same outcome for, for the patient from, from clinical endpoints. But the family's viewpoint of that may be that Dr. One is good and provided me with family-centered care because he did it that way. And Dr. Two came along and just changed everything because that's how Dr. Two wanted to do it. When we communicate with one another about the plan and have a standard way of approaching these patients, that, that really helps and that improves the patient and family-centered care experience because they feel like we are all operating on the same page. And uh, I can't tell you how just keeping that in mind actually makes our lives easier as clinicians because then we don't have to spend the time 
backtracking out of a situation that we've gotten ourselves into. And the family's happy because they perceive that the care they've gotten is coordinated and that people are communicating with one another. And yet at the end of the day, we've achieved the same outcome clinically. So it's just food for thought. But again, um, we'll end our part of the, uh, of, the talk, the, of the talk here. And again, I, I want to thank the Society for Critical Care Medicine and Project Dispatch, uh, and also all of our colleagues here at the Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital, both on the medical staff and in administration, and um, the entire uh, care team of providers in the pediatric ICU and, and our um, affiliated units, and of course the patients and, and their families for, for allowing us to do what we do, because it really is uh, a privilege to be able to get up and do this every day. So thank you for your time. Well, thank you, uh, Jason and Eileen. That was really a, a great presentation. We'll go ahead and start taking questions uh, at this point for the Q&A. We're getting uh, several in on the uh, chat, and so we'll uh, ask those, and then we'll uh, see what we have on the raise your hand feature. But uh, the first question is, is there a communication tool that is multidisciplinary? If so, what is that process? What are the barriers? Well, I think it, this, to, to answer this question, I think that it depends on who is doing the communicating. So as far as the communication amongst the staff, which is important, there are some tools. The SBAR tool um, uh, is something that our nurses use in their, in their handoffs. Um, the, keep in mind that one of the things that's unique about our institution is that it's all attending level um, intensive care providers who are providing the care here. We don't have fellows or residents providing the care. Um, so everyone has, and everyone's been out of training for quite a number of years. So that when they communicate with the families, there, there isn't a specific tool that they are using for that communication. But amongst ourselves, when we are providing handoffs to ourselves, we do have um, some checklists that are posted on our, um, our mobile, um, uh, computer devices going around the unit, and when nurses do their bedside handoffs in front of the families, that is an SBAR handoff. Um, and we round um, in a very similar fashion three times a day at the bedside as physician groups, once in the morning, once in the afternoon, and then once at um, once in it, at night, the ICU doctor who's on call that night rounds with the uh, rounds with the um, the nighttime nurses as well. OK. I think I know the answer to this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway, because I think you said that you don't have trainees. But I just wanted to see. Um, the question is, do families remain in the room during a procedure being done? And the extent of the question was done by a trainee, Are such as a resident. Well, we don't have residents doing procedure like Dr. Adler said. We have um, just attending level. Um, but the families do remain in the room. They have to um, garb up in terms of if it's a sterile procedure. We have parents at the bedside when we're changing VADs out. We have parents at the bedside if we're closing a chest at the bedside. So, And it's their choice. Some parents don't wish to remain at the bedside. Others do. But they, they follow the same. They have to stay in the back of the room. They're not standing, obviously, at the bedside. But they are allowed to remain in the room during the procedure. OK. Our next question is, when you started implementing uh, patient and family-centered care, how did you educate families? That is, that is not always an easy thing to do. And I think that that's a great question because that was one of our uh, greatest fears. And, and, and even then, it's something that we um, struggled, struggle with a little bit today. I, I can tell you a couple of things that I think helped. I think setting expectations um, up front is very helpful. There are many different ways to do that. Um, we've created a brochure um, that we provide to families when they're um, admitted. We Our nurses are really good at they, they have a, a, a script, so to speak, that they follow when the patients are admitted. And it does 
talk to the families after they've had an opportunity to settle into the ICU about the rounding process uh, and letting them know what the, what the expectations are. But I think the brochure has been helpful. I think the nursing guidance to families has been helpful. That and basically, it doesn't have to be lengthy, but just to tell families, listen, we want you to be here. We want you to participate. We're going to set some guidelines for you and boundaries for you that we want to adhere to. And then I think also, as the clinicians, not being shy about redirecting people when they've crossed that boundary. I think sometimes people feel like, well, I'm not being family-centered if I say to someone, listen, this your issue is important. Now is not the best venue for us to discuss it. Let me come back and talk to you after rounds are done, and we can talk about that. Because one of the things that people are concerned about is having too much conversation on rounds. And I think just doing that the right way is 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 OK. But you can set boundaries, and you can set guidance. And I think it's extremely important to do that so that people understand it's not a free-for-all. And there are certain things that you have to do that are different than being at home in order for your child to get the care that that they need. Okay. Um, I think we'll turn uh, to uh, open up some uh, phone lines. Melissa, can we open up Mark Kelly's phone line to ask his question? Okay, Mark, you should be able to ask your question. I think we are having trouble hearing you. Okay. And it shows you're actually away. So if you want to go ahead and pick someone else. All right. I believe we answered Lori Muller's uh, question since she asked a question via chat. Uh, let me see what else we have um, in the question box. Uh, please. Uh, Feel free to share questions uh, with us uh, while we tee up some others. So this is your chance to ask uh, Jason and Eileen uh, questions. Um, let's see. I have a question here about uh, can you uh, talk about whether you have a discharge checklist for X premature infants coming from the NICU? Yeah, we have an extensive checklist for our NICU to PICU transition babies that are going home. It's um, depending on the diagnosis of the the infant or the, the young child. We have uh, one for single patients. We have one for our BPD patients. It's also we, we utilize EPIC for charting, and the the discharge checklist can also be found in the computer. Great. Our next question, um, and again, we're uh, Open for uh, the Q&A a little bit longer, folks. Uh, but our next question is, how do you avoid confusion with families and frustration on the part of families whose children have been in the PICU for a protracted period of time? Do they see inconsistencies in care? I, I, uh, the answer is that that is challenging. And um, families do, families who've been in the ICU for a, a long period of time uh, um, with a child who has a complex critical illness are become very savvy at picking up on differences in care, whether it be amongst our nurses, our respiratory therapists, our intensivists. Um, when families come from newborn intensive care unit to the PICU, they'll often say, oh, it's very different here than there. And we have to do a good job of providing, I look at it like anticipatory guidance uh, to families, much like a pediatrician would do in the office about things to expect. And I think if we explain what to expect and tell them why we do the things we do, even though they're different, while people have trouble getting over that, sometimes if they've been doing it a different way for many months, um, if we explain to them that we do things you know, much like pilots do things the same way when they take off in an airplane and land it, we try and do the things the same way in healthcare to, to provide your child with good care. However, when we deviate from that, and there are differences, and there's always going to be differences when you're dealing with human beings, that even the subtlest of things, sometimes parents can pick up on that and deem that as quote unquote not good care. And I provided that example um, earlier. Um, and it may be perfectly good care, but their perception is that it's not. So I think a lot of times just hearing them, conversing with them, and 
some, and then deciding whether or not you can adapt your practices to that. Sometimes the request may not be adaptable, um, but sometimes that you may be able to adapt to that request. I can think of examples where we could not adapt to the request. Um, the fa one family I remember um, didn't like how we suctioned not using a, a certain suction system, whereas uh, where they had come from before, they used a different methodology for suctioning the, the endotracheal tube in the patient. But all our respiratory therapists and nurses are trained the same way. And we said, that's we, we understand your concern. We appreciate it. We acknowledge it. It's important. But let us try our way. We haven't had a ventilator associated with in, in two years. And, um, and they grew to embrace it. But but over time but but those are the types of things that if you're not willing to be open and converse about it, they can get you into a sticky situation. Okay, we have uh, some more questions coming in. Uh, so um, we are gonna try to end at the top of the hour. Uh, but the next question is do you allow caregivers of trached patients to provide respiratory care such as suctioning? when the patient is critically ill? Do, do, I'm sorry, the question was, do we allow care providers, caregivers, to, to, caregivers. Provide, to provide care and suctioning of a tracheostomy when the patients are critically ill? Yes. I, I would say that, that, that it depends. Um, if we have a, a, certainly with a fresh tracheostomy where a family's not been trained, the answer is absolutely not. Um, and you know, I would I would liken this to: Do we allow parents to adjust um, IV pumps or alarms or things like that? The answer is absolutely not, because at the end of the day, we're responsible for that. Having said that, if a child has a chronic tracheostomy and a stable a stable airway, and the parents are doing this at home anyway, and they're very good at it. Absolutely, we will partner with them if their child's in for pneumonia, but they're not highly unstable. Yes, we would allow them to participate in that, and we would encourage that. Um, you know, and, and it's an opportunity for teaching, because ultimately they're going to have to take the child home. But if the child's highly unstable, if the child um, has a tracheostomy, but they're on multiple inotropic infusions, um, in that scenario, the answer is that we that we would that we would not, but we would hear them out. I think it's more important not so much the decision you make, but rather that you hear them out and explain what your particular unit's approach to that issue is. Okay. Our next question is, do you have families that attempt to pick and choose caregivers, especially nurses? If so, what is your response? So the I'm just repeating the question. The question was, do you have uh, uh, parents or caregivers who try to pick and choose the caregivers that are in the hospital, do they try and pick and choose um, nurses? And I'm going to let um, Eileen answer that question, and I can answer it from a physician standpoint, too. I would just say from a physician standpoint, people do sometimes have a preference, um, and I, I've, I have learned to, um, to just say that that's, that's fine, but we don't, if someone, at the end of the day, the intensive care doctor who's here has to care for the, all the you know has to care for the patients so they can't pick and choose who who's going to care for their child if they don't like the person that's here or the, then it's a team effort they probably need to go somewhere else and that's our general approach to that we don't take requests like that it, it just you can't it doesn't work like that when you work as a team um, and I would say I'll let a, Eileen address it from a nursing perspective but we have a we have a pretty united front when it comes to that because that's when you get into splitting of the care team and that's very destructive. Um, and again, we have to hear their concerns when they have a concern about a particular care provider, particularly if it's legitimate. And I think that's the important thing also is determining what's a legitimate complaint versus I just don't like this person's personality. Um, those, are diff those are two different issues. I and mean, I'm going to let Eileen comment on that as well. I would say that this is a pretty regular issue that comes up at some point um, in a hospitalization of somebody who's been here long term. The way that I usually deal with it, it with parents is the same thing that Dr. Adler is saying that go to the parents in terms of do you have a concern about the care that this person was giving your child and if there's not a legitimate concern for the care um, we don't allow for picking and choosing. This is one of also the um, 
the things when we when we do have these long term patients that the nurses get to know the family so well and know so much of their dynamics. There are some questions of boundaries. And in order to provide good care, we know we have to be objective in terms of what we're looking at. So we struggle with it both on the nursing side and on the family side um, in order that, to do that. But we don't, ex we don't allow, and that's explained to the parents, that we all provide the same care. Everybody might do it a little bit differently, but unless they have a legitimate concern in terms of the care that the nurse has been provided for the parents, we don't, we don't allow that. We try to do primary nursing on some of our long-term patients just because the patient um, does benefit more by it, but in terms of just actually asking for who's going to take care of their patient, we try not to do that. Okay, we are past the top of the hour. Um, I don't know if we can ask the last two questions. Um, if uh, Jason and Eileen are available, and uh, Melissa, are we okay to go ahead and ask the last two questions quickly? Uh, as long as it's okay with our presenters, I think we're fine. Great. Sure. All right. Uh, the next question is, how did you change the behavior and thoughts of the ICU professionals? This is a very difficult point in our ICU. The nurses think they do enough, quote unquote. However, the service and compassion can be better, to my opinion. So it seems a culture problem. I can't honestly sit here and say it was easy, especially for nurses that have been around for a while. Um, when some of the newer nurses come in, it's just our culture and they just kind of adapt to it. I think the biggest change that I saw is when we, from the time that we first started, where we had kind of had this misinterpretation of what patient and family center care was and it was what we, ha what we were giving to the parents, what we were giving to the parents, rather than what we were, tools we were giving to them to help facilitate. And that's probably where I had, I seen the biggest change with nursing. Um, that they felt in the beginning we were giving them, giving them meals, giving them this, giving them that, but we weren't making them truly a partner in the care. We were just giving them things. When we made the transition and really sat down and said, hey, this is not what we really want. We really want to give them tools so they can get through this hospitalization and actively participate in their child's care. That's where I saw the biggest change. And just to dovetail onto what Eileen said, you, I. I believe that in order to accomplish this, that you need to establish champions. You need nursing champions and you need um, physician champions uh, who are going to, to lead this. And uh, the, I, like I said, we, we as the physician group are also um, reluctant to enter into this. I think there's a lot of fear associated with people starting this and how uh, it's just going to make their job more difficult. Um, but if you, I think if you can change your the way you think a little bit. And you think about if you've ever been a patient, then you can understand why you should do patient and family centered care. And if you haven't, it does make it a little bit of a challenge. But imagine that it's your child lying in the bed or that you're lying in the bed. What would you want? And I think when you look at it like that, it really helps. There I watched a and I forget a, a an intensive care doctor recently talked about her experience as an intent as a patient in a hospital where she almost um, died after giving birth. It was an incredible talk. You can look it up on YouTube. I can't remember what the name of it was. It was somewhere in Michigan. But if anyone questions why you should be family centered after that, I think it really hits home for you. So I think when you put yourself in people's shoes, that goes a long way. But I think you need champions to get you there. That's just my two cents on that. Well, great. Before I ask our last question, I want to remind our attendees that today's webcast is, in fact, recorded and will be posted on the Project Dispatch website in the near future, I believe in the next week or so. So uh, with that, uh, our last question is, how long is a typical round and how many patients are seen? And then what members of the team, nurses, RT, et cetera, are present? Is this consistent? So our, our rounds, it depends on which rounds you're talking about. Morning rounds are the longest rounds. Those are the multidisciplinary rounds that occur with the doctors, nurses, pharmacists, social workers, nutritionists, um, palliative care team, uh, parents. Those rounds, we, we've divided up the ICU into services. There's a cardiac service. Those rounds can take anywhere on 11 to 12 patients, can take anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour and a half. Um, just depends on the level of complexity and how much 
conversation and dialogue needs to go on. We try and limit the time for that. Um, the other um, patient, the other um, service um, that rounds in the ICU, th those rounds take about another similar amount of time, 45 minutes for another 10 to 12 um, patients. And then our intermediate care unit rounds are quicker and they, we think they should be because the patients have a lower level of complexity. Um, so, um, and then also it's very quick. Oftentimes the parents choose not to participate. Uh, they may be there, but they don't want, you know, they, they may not want to participate, but they have, the important thing is that they, they have the option. Our evening rounds, families are, uh, we don't exclude them from listening, but we don't have active dialogue with them. The evening rounds, intensivist to intensivist sign off, that's really not meant for time for dialogue and rounding. That's really, we set the guidelines that that's morning rounds. Same thing with night rounds. The night rounds are for the intensives to round with the staff. If there is an acute patient issue and the family needs to talk to the intensives, the intensives generally goes in the room. And I'll let Eileen comment on the nursing component of rounds with their sign outs. With the nursing rounds, we work 12-hour shifts, so we also do rounds in the morning and rounds in the evening. Rounds in the morning, um, the rounds are done at the patient bedside. Um, we do give the families option for the morning talking to them um, the evening beforehand if they want to have rounds at the bedside in the morning because some of the families are sleeping. Um, the rounds probably take about 15, 20 minutes per patient. Our patient ratio is one to one, one to two. And the rounds um, in the afternoon is the same. And the families typically um, are there. They're listening. It's not a open dialogue. They can ask questions if they want, but they, they have a tendency more to ask the questions um, with the interdisciplinary rounds than they do with the nursing rounds. Okay, that concludes our question and answer session. And I want to thank our faculty, Jason Adler and Eileen Watkins, for their time today. I also want to thank our attendees today. I think uh, this was really a terrific webcast. Um, and one that, of course, will be available on the Project Dispatch website. And so with that, uh, our uh, webcast is concluded. Thank you, everyone, so much. Bye-bye.